Hi. Um, for about 30 years now, a little more than that, I've been paying the rent by flying airplanes. And I want to tell you about an occasion that was in 1981 when I was first starting. Uh, I had a job flying um, a s very small single engine propeller driven airplane uh, where I carried uh, time critical documents, bank checks, credit card stuff, and uh, contracts and things like that from Phoenix to Albuquerque, New Mexico and back every day. And uh, I wasn't allowed to carry passengers, so it was kind of lonely. But one day, my boss caught me coming out of the hangar and said, tomorrow I want you to carry a passenger. One of our clients wants to send her son to Albuquerque, and uh, he's going to have a couple of suitcases and a puppy and a pet carrier. So I said, OK, uh, great. You know, I, it, it's tiring uh, being alone all the time in the airplane. I showed up the next morning. There's the young man and his mother. It was clear that they were not getting along at all. <laughs> and. Uh, but instead of, uh, there was a little problem because he had way too much stuff. Instead of two suitcases, he had uh, a television and a duffel bag full of sporting gear and a whole bunch of other stuff, really more than should have gone in my airplane. And the puppy turned out to be a six-month-old St. Bernard. <laughs> and uh, so they, they did have a, a crate for it, but the crate was too big to fit into any opening in this airplane. So we couldn't carry the crate. It was clear, though, that the boy really wanted to go. When I said I might not take him, he began to uh, tear up. So uh, I got all his stuff in the airplane. I, I got all of my uh, boxes full of data and contracts and overnight envelopes on and got him strapped in. And then I made a little uh, place right behind me for the dog, a, a little space about 20 inches square. I'll stop and tell you a little bit about the airplane. It, it was designed to only carry four people. but Two of the seats had been taken out, uh, leaving only the pilot seat and one passenger seat. And those seats were little bucket seats like you would find in maybe a 60, 1960 Corvette. You know, they came to about your shoulder blades. There were no headrests or anything like that. And so it was me and the boy and the dog right behind me. The uh, dog licked my ears and my neck a little bit. And we took off. As we climbed out, we were trying to uh, rise above the mountains east of Phoenix. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, it was clear that something was wrong. The dog was unhappy. So as we leveled off, it became evident that not only was he terrified, but he was also going to be airsick. And uh, shortly, there was uh, projectile vomiting all over the airplane and uh, an amazing episode of doggy diarrhea in addition. So it was kind of a small space. Uh, but the first thing that came to my notice was the dog was turning around in circles and tracking the poop and the vomit all around the airplane and all over the freight and, and so forth. And as he turned around, uh, he was using his tail to sort of scoop it up. And then it would come back around. I would see his tail coming toward me from behind. And I had scooted my seat up very close to the front in order to make space for him. And the control yoke of the airplane was very close. So as his tail would come by, I would try to lean forward and push the uh, airplane forward. It would descend a little bit. And, uh, and then as the tail would go by, I could sit back up. And, and we would uh, so we had this kind of synchronized ballet going, the dog and I. Uh, with every turn of the dog, there would be a porpoise of the airplane. And so for some time, we sort of flew like this across Arizona. Uh, also, the stench was uh, pretty bad, and um, so uh, I thought uh, I might join the dog in barfing for a while. But uh, anyway, so I, I said to the young man, I, I have these giant uh, handy wipes. I would like for you to take these and gather up as much of the stuff as you can. And uh, I, it was not a pressurized airplane. I had a little vent window next to me, and I said, gather it up, and I'm going to throw it out the window. <laughs> So he handed me, he, he did, he gathered up a, a large amount of it and handed me this thing that looked like a cartoon stork uh, kind of thing. And uh, I opened the little vent window and shoved it out. But before I could marvel at the streak down the side of the airplane there, um, there was a, a tremendous racket, this And it turned out that uh, my landing gear had extended right then. Even though we were hundreds of miles from Albuquerque and uh, Okay, and um, 
so this airplane had a little safety feature, uh, a little tube on the side of the airplane that sensed airflow. Uh, and when the airflow got too uh, low, it would extend the landing gear in the event that the pilot had forgotten to do it uh, before landing. So I couldn't figure out why right now the gear would come down, but I looked down out the window and pressed my face up against and looked through the brown streaks there. And I could see uh, that I could see the tube and stuck to the end of it was a turd. Uh, so there was no airflow at all in there. And that, that's why my gear had come down. So we had to fly all the way to Albuquerque with the uh, gear. Out. Uh, so anyway, uh, we arrived in Albuquerque and landed, and we could see the father of the, of the young man parked in a pickup. I went in and went to the bathroom, and uh, when I came back out, the kid and the dog and the dad were gone without so much as a thanks a lot, you know. And uh, my uh, driver for my freight arrived. He was a very, very depressed, striking air traffic controller. You, re you may remember 1981. And uh, I said, hey, man. Uh, it's going to be a little unusual today. Many of the parcels that you're going to deliver to these corporate offices are going to be smeared with dog poo and vomit. And uh, he just kind of uh, went like that. And I don't remember what I said to him, but maybe what I should have said was, you know, we just need to rise above it all. 